friends. I want to do this video because it's going to be a little bit nerdy. I'm going to pull back the uh, the curtains to show you some behind the scenes work. But uh, so I'm, I've been trying to raise cash because I'm a little concerned about uh, the markets and the economy. And um, we've raised quite a bit and we're, we're trying to raise a little bit more. So we're going through every position in the portfolio and, and looking at what we could possibly uh, trim or sell. And um, so I'm a little, frankly, a little bit concerned about the interest rates. I think they're gonna, it's a good chance that Fed, Fed's gonna raise three quarters to a percent uh, this month. And the market generally is not a big fan of that. And it doesn't seem like it's gonna be the last time that they raise during this cycle. And a little concerned about the war in Europe. Um, when it first started, uh, Zelensky looked like a hero and he, he stood up to Russia and um, amazing the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Uh, they fought back aggressively and the West seemed to unite and um, ex extreme uh, financial measures. They uh, took, um, took a uh, rush off the SWIFT system. They did, a lot of companies pulled out of Russia and they seemed to deliver a crippling blow to Russia. But it seems like the Russian people took the shot. Um, they uh, weathered the storm, if you will, and um, so now Putin's selling his oil to China and India. He's flush with cash. He's weathered the, the West's big shot, and um, so I'm a little concerned about that. So we're trying to raise cash. I'm looking at the different companies in the portfolio, and one of the companies in our portfolio is T. Rowe Price, and I was like, man, there's no way I could sell this, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that are um, mind blowing, at least for me. And so, uh, T. Rowe Price is an asset manager. Um, they get paid largely based on assets under management, and I could, I, I understand that their assets under management may have gone down in the last quarter, like like mine have. Um, so they, they might have a little bit of a challenging quarter. But when I look at the the price relative to what you get for this company, it's like, oh my gosh, there's no way that I could sell this company. So let me just show you a couple of things. So I'm on this site called Guru Focus, and it's um, for about, it's oriented for um, value investors. And it gives you a lot of really interesting details. So here's the price chart of T. Rowe Price. This is going back to 1986, and it's gone up quite a bit, pretty consistently. And then, uh, in the in, la in COVID, there was this big run up. It peaked in uh, August of '01, and then it's come back dramatically. It's at one 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 five, and so we bought it right around here. We've. Um, we bought it a couple months ago. Okay, so we thought it looked really cheap when we bought it, and it's gotten even a little bit cheaper. But let me show you a couple things. So this is one thing that we'd like to look at. This is the dividend yield in pink and the stock price in blue. And, and one thing, um, when the dividend yield is high relative to where it historically trades that tends to be a good entry point. So this was, I'm pointing right here to March of 2009, which was the bottom of the market and the financial crisis. And the dividend yield had gotten up to 3.84%. And it coincided with an excellent, excellent time to buy it. A great entry point, okay? This grayed out part means that the economy was in a recession. So it's towards the end of the recession but not the end yet, and the stock bottomed out. The the dividend yield was way up. Okay. The other, um, the dot com bubble was two thousand to two thousand two, and the stock had a uh, went from seems like a high of about twenty three on a split adjusted basis all the way down to thirteen. So it was a huge drop. But at the bottom, 
you see you it was like you could identify it by it. the dividend yield had spiked up so you notice that there's a inverse relationship with the dividend yield in this and the stock price again back in 1990 um, the dividend yield went way up and it was a great time to buy you can't really tell because of but it had gotten up to like a dollar eighty and uh, where is there it is a dollar eighty two in February and it bottomed out around a uh, dollar seven in October and so that's about a forty percent drop and is represented by the dividend yield being really high okay so in general, you like to buy when the dividend yield is at a, at a high historical rate. So today, here's the dividend yield. Okay. As high as it's ever been. The only time it came close to that was about the same dividend yield was at the absolute bottom of the, um, uh, the financial crisis, March 2009. Perfect, perfect time to buy this stock, right? And you see how it had, how it did in the, in the time, uh, since that time. Okay, so that's a huge, huge buy signal right there. Let's look at some other things. Any other by any other metric, they all look incredible. Okay, so price to sales. Now this is a not an inverse relationship, but direct relate. So when that price to sales, when you could get it for. Um, a very low multiple of sales that's when you want to buy it so the bottom of the financial crisis um, february 2009 price to sales was at three point march 2009 3.28 the very bottom right great entry point to buy look where it is right now at that same level the only time in the last 25 years that it's been that low was um for for a few minutes in, or a few days, I don't know, in March of 2009. So this would have been a great entry point at this low of a price to sales. Okay, let's look at price to book. I'm gonna change the color on this so it pops a little bit better. Okay, again, direct relate, you wanna buy it when you get it at the lowest multiple to its book value. Um, so 2003, the dot-com bubble, at the bottom of the market, it was trading at 2.76 times book value. Would have been a great entry point. Bottom of the uh, financial crisis was trading at 2.6 times book value. Also would have been a great entry point. Right now, it's trading at 2.89 times book value. I think a great entry point. It doesn't get much better than that. Let's look at price to earnings. Okay, price to earnings. Again, going back 30 years, right now the price to earnings is nine times earnings. It has never traded that low, ever. Not in 2008, not in 2009, not in 2002, 2003. Not in 1994, after Greenspan raised rates six times. It has never traded at this level of earnings. That's as cheap as it gets. Okay, and let's show you what we're getting for at this incredibly low price. So, well, let's get Guru Focus's commentary on it. So, it's a five-star rated company. And this star rating represents the predictability of the company um, because when you do value investing it really only wor it works best the more predictable or bond like the company is so a five star rating means is quite predictable so meaning you could use value type of analysis to to me to re to uh, evaluate the company they're showing that it's significantly undervalued uh, according to their valuation metrics right and they're also, they have these 10 good signs. So they have one warning sign, asset growth, faster revenue growth. One insider sold some stock. 
their forward P ratio is a little bit lower than their trailing P ratio. But look at these 10 good signs. Interest coverage is good. That means they don't have, um, the debt payments are not a strain to them. Uh, Banesh M score, unlikely manipulator. That's met, it attests to the quality of the management. Um, and so they, they manage money for a living, so, and they manage their business very well over the last several decades. They have a very good reputation of um, being a well-managed company. Their art operating margin is expanding. Their price to book is close to a 10-year low, as we saw. Price to earnings close to a 10-year low. Revenue is showing consistent growth. Price to sales close to a 10-year low. Financial strength is very strong. We'll see that. The dividend yield is close to a 10-year high, and their Altman Z score is very strong. So let's look at their financials. And, well, and then we'll look at their dividends. So their revenue has shown consistent growth over the last one, five, and 10 years. And it's not just the top line, the bottom line uh, as well. Their free cash flow as well, their dividends as well book value as well so look at their income statement this is amazing so here's over the last 15 um no actually this is more years yeah about 15 years um, the revenue has just consistently been in the on the upswing year over year it tends to there's a little bit of pullback here, seven, eight, nine, but then they recovered. And if you notice, besides red means is a negative number. Look at everything is black besides how much they pay in taxes. Okay, and you go up here, everything is black, meaning positive. Look at the trends, long-term consistent upward trends. Um, amazing. Look at the income statement. Their gross margins are about 60%. That means 60% of their revenue after the cost of goods sold, they still have left over. Um, and it's holding up. It's very consistent. It actually as high as it's been in the last five years. Okay. And then you have your operating expenses and their operating margin very low operating even after they pay all their operating expenses they still have 40 47 percent of their uh, revenue and then you look at their and then they have to pay taxes now here's interesting their tax rate had been consistently about 38 percent then in 2017 we had the trump tax cut and their tax rate dropped to about 20 24 25 percent about 23 this is in transition and they leveled off about 23%. So after they pay taxes, their net margins that hits their bottom line, 37% of their revenue hits the bottom line. An insanely profitable company, okay? And they've been slowly, not they're not been extremely aggressive, them, but slowly they're buying back their stock. See how it's trending down? Um, so they're, they're giving money back to shareholders, buying back their stock. So they're not diluting you. The um, longer you hold on to that, you own a bigger share of, of their stock. Um, now let's look at their balance sheet. This is what you would call a fortress balance sheet. They have $2.9 billion in current assets. Okay. 9% um, of long-term assets, $12 billion in total assets. Of that, about... 3.5 billion is intangibles. Okay, so about 9 billion in tangible assets. Let's look at their current liabilities are up a measly 632 million. We like to see this number smaller than their current assets. And uh, they have current asset coverage of about five times. That's crazy. Their current ratio is about five to one, just under five to one. That's insanely good. Their current assets, their total liabilities, 2.2 billion. In their in current assets, they have 2.9. So their current assets are more than their total liabilities. That's an incredibly good 
sign of a fortress balance sheet. Okay, so let me show you one other thing. This is just it's beautiful. It's looking it's like looking at a at a model. <laughs> um, okay, their dividends. Okay, so they're paying a four point one five percent. That's the current dividend yield. That's a dividend payout ratio of 0.36. That means they pay out 36% of their earnings in the form of a dividend, which is very, um, it's not a strain. That's a decent number. And they've grown their dividend by 15% a year. Okay, so we saw that the dividend yield right now is the highest it's been. That's usually a good entry point. And look at their payout ratio. Okay, so they've been raising their dividend, and some companies um, are committed to raise their dividend every year, right? Even if it means they're paying out more and more of their earnings. Well, this company has been raising their dividend by 15% a year, and in the last 14 years, their payout ratio has consistently been coming down. That means they're very comfortable paying out this 4% this dividend yield. There's plenty of of, of cash to do that okay and so and they just raised it um last year they were paying a dollar eight they raised this per quarter now it's a dollar 20 per quarter so that's about a 12 percent increase knowing that you know we're in kind of in a slowdown period and they still felt very comfortable raising their dividend 1.2 fully knowing that um you know there's it, it looked terribly bad if they if they had to lower that dividend. So usually um, the board, when they decide, and this is a totally arbitrary, this is decided by the board, how much should we pay in dividend? If if they raise their dividend by 12% to $1.20, what it means is they're very comfortable in being able to pay $1.20 into the foreseeable future and, and likely to be able to raise it next year. Because if you look, They've been paying a dividend for a long time. Um, this goes back to 2017. This goes back all the way to 1986. And they've probably been paying it longer, but um, Guru Focus only keeps records back to 86. So they've consistently been paying a dividend for the last um, 35 years or more. And if you go through these numbers, it's like they raise it every year. So they paid an extra dividend here. But last year was 108. The year before was 90 cents. So they raised it um, 18 cents, which is a huge raise. That's a 20% increase, right? So if you are if you're a long-term holder of this stock, and let's say you initially bought it, it was paying a 3 or 4% dividend, your yield on cost, meaning... Your yield, based on what you paid for it, if you bought it three years ago, you're getting 6% because of the dividend increases. If you bought it five years ago, you're getting 8% off of your initial investment. If you bought it 10 years, you're getting 13%. And if this continues, you could say, over time, you're going to expect your dividend to go up and your, and your yield on cost to go up. So... It's an incredibly strong company, and it's trading incredibly cheap right now. I mean, I cannot see a reason why I would sell this. Um, let me show you one other thing. So we're going to look at their cash flow. Look at their cash flow statement. Okay, here's their cash flow statement. So their cash flow from operations, you notice that also has consistently gone up. So it's about three and a half uh, billion dollars is their cash flow. And then they, they spend about 200 million just to maintain the company. Um, usually that's investment in technology, CapEx. Okay, so their free cash flow is a, a little bit over $3 billion. Okay, so how much are you paying for that $3 billion in cash flow? Without looking at their market cap, 
I would say I would not want to pay more than 20 times, which would be $60 billion for this company. Um, and if I could pay 10 times, I'd be really excited, $30 billion. Oh, what's this company? This company is trading, the market cap is 26. So you're, this company right now is trading at nine times free cash flow. That's incredibly, incredibly good. I mean, there's, I can't imagine selling this company. Um, so T. Rowe Price, if we look, it seems to have bottomed out about uh, June 16th, a month ago, uh, at about 104, right? So I think we still, I think this is still an amazing, amazing entry point uh, where we are right now. So yeah, I'm trying to raise cash, but I'm not gonna do it by selling T. Row Price. As, as scary as the future looks, um, this company that's, I'll tell you a little bit more about the company. They're out of, they're out of Baltimore, Maryland. They're a financial service company. They're in the asset management business. They have 7,500 employees. Tiro Price was founded in 1937. So they've been around a while. Okay, and uh, they, they, they run a great business. Um, and they're trading is insanely cheap right now and we're getting a 4% dividend off it. So I'm not selling this. I might even buy some more. But that just, uh, hopefully we got to come behind the scenes and and see what we do and see what we're looking at and uh, and uh, how we're managing the portfolio. So I hope that gives you some comfort. And maybe it's an indicator that, I don't know if the whole market is, is close to a bottom, but this company looks historically close to a bottom. Even if we look at the last uh, three big, uh, big pullbacks, looking at uh, 2009, 2000, it's trading at those levels. And, and if you look at any big blue chip company in the S&P, um, they're all going to show, I don't know about right now, but in, they all bottomed around 2003, 2009. Not all of them, but a good, good chunk of these good quality companies like that. So if this one's bottoming, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not calling the bottom in the market, but I'm saying T. Rowe Price looks like a good entry point. Okay, so... Hope that uh, gives you some insight into what we do and hope you guys have a great weekend.